A few years ago, I was talking with a fellow named Colin Kerr, and Colin at the time was our DCE here at the Second Church. Now he's the pastor of a new church development up the street. And I asked Colin something, and uh, he looked at me straight, looked at me straight, and he said this. Uh, he said, word. He said, word. <laughs> and then he turned and he left. Well, then I thought, I thought there must be something positive about the occurrence because, see, I, I think, I thought that he thought that that was sufficient. But I wasn't so sure, so I did what every responsible seeker would do in such a circumstance. I went to the Urban Dictionary. And in the Urban Dictionary, I found it. There it was, word, <laughs> an agreement, <laughs> an agreement. Well said. Well, you know, I've used that word word a couple of times uh, since then, mostly to um, see my daughter's eyes roll. <laughs> that right, Cece? <laughs> but I feel it to be true, especially true that the church has to be attentive. We have to be attentive to styles and language and the music to be relevant, to be relevant and to to be effective. You know, it's not that we are to pander to every form of music and everything, but we respect. We respect that different folks respond in different ways to language and music. And the history of the church bears witness. Now, we worship. What we say, what we study, what we sing, all has a consequence. And if we're to be the conduits of the righteousness and the love and the justice of Jesus Christ, we have to pay attention. If we are to reach those who don't yet know Jesus, we have to pay attention. We have to recognize that what we do and what we say and how we say it and how we do it has a difference, makes a difference. Now there's been a lot uttered from all sides the last few weeks over every platform that you can imagine that purports to be truth. But is it? From either party, from either side, is it really truth? You know, a few years ago, a Charleston homeboy named Stephen Colbert deemed uh, a word that was to be a new word in one of his monologues, uh, actually a reinvention, and the word was truthiness. Have y'all heard that, the word truthiness? The quality of seeming or being felt to be true, even if not necessarily true. You see, truthiness is the, is the quality by which a person purports to know something emotionally or, or instinctively without regard to evidence. Truthiness is also what I say is right and what anybody else will say cannot possibly be true. But it's not only that I feel it to be true, but it's that I feel it to be true. So you see, it also has an equality that's self-serving. Now. This word was felt to be so representative of the culture at that time, it was recognized as the word of the year. And since then, there have been a number of words that have sought to portray the, the nature, the, the ethos of the times. About three years ago, there was post-truth. Post-truth relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotional personal belief. You know, no wonder we're in such a pickle. So what could be more timely? What could be more timely than the true word, the true word of our Lord? So this morning, let's hear the word of our Lord from the letter of James to the people. Reading that will be Sally McDuffie. I will be reading from a contemporary version known as The Message, James 1, 17 through 27. Every desirable and beneficial gift comes out of heaven. The gifts are the river of light cascading down from the Father of light. There is nothing deceitful in God, nothing two-faced, nothing fickle. He brought us to life using the true word. 
showing us off as the crown of all his creatures. Post this in the intersection, dear friends. Lead with your ears. Follow up with your tongue. Let anger straggle along in the rear. God's righteousness doesn't grow from human anger. So throw all the spoiled virtue and cancerous evil in the garbage. In simple humility, let our gardener God landscape you with the word, making a salvation garden of your life. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you are a listener when you are anything but. Letting the word go in one ear and out the other. Act on what you hear. Those that hear and don't act are like those who glance in a mirror, walk away, and two minutes later they have no idea of who they are or what they were like. But whoever catches a glimpse of the revealed counsel of God, the free life, even out of the corner of his eye and sticks with it, is no distracted scatterbrain, but a man or woman of action. That person will find delight and affirmation in the action. Anyone who sets himself up as religious by, taking, <clears throat> by talking a good game is self-deceived. This kind of religion is hot air and only hot air. Real religion, the kind that passes muster before God the Father, is this. Reach out to the homeless and the loveless in their plight and guard against corruption and the godless world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we thank you for your word, and I pray that you will pour through me this day the word that you would have us hear. Uh, your word, Lord, not my opinion. Your word that will touch us at our point of need. And I pray this, Lord. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. The book of James. The book of James is a very practical book. And uh, if you read closely, you'll, and listen even closer, you'll hear echoes of the Sermon on the Mount. James is an important part of the manual for living that we are giving, given, the Word of God, the good news. The good news that tells us not only what we are to do, how we are to behave, but that we are loved. That we are loved and we will be strengthened. We'll be strengthened and equipped and sent forth in confidence by the God Whose, imagine, whose image we are made. And what does that mean that we are made in God's image? As in the first verse of our text for today, we are to be generous as is the Father of lights. Generous as is the Father of lights. And who is that? It's the one who hung the sun and the moon and the stars, the one who engineers the sun to rise every morning, the one who withholds nothing. In God's generosity, God made a decision to birth us. Made a decision to birth us into being by God's word. There you are. By God's word, in God's truth, through God's love, led by God's spirit for God's purpose, to be the first fruits of God's creatures. And what are the first fruits? Well, the first fruits are the, the first of the, the grain. It's the first of the animals. It's the one that is first that is not to be killed or eaten or kept or worked. We are to be the beginning of the harvest. Men and women, we give ourselves. We give ourselves. So how do we manifest this? Being caused, born, and nurtured for God's purpose, how do we manifest this to be God's bounty? Well, we defy the ways of culture and we're not quick-tempered, but quick to listen. We're not quick to pop off, but slow to speak. We're not hot-headed or mercurial. We're slow to anger. And why? Because our anger doesn't lead to God's righteousness. Our anger doesn't lead to God's righteousness. In fact, if we listen, 
If we think before we speak, we may save ourselves the toxins that our anger may, may be uh, inflicted upon us and upon our righteous God. In fact, if we listen, if we think before we speak, we will be obedient. So therefore, James says, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness. In the message translation, it says, so throw all spoiled virtue and cancerous evil in the garbage and welcome with meekness. With meekness and with gentleness, the word implanted, either sown or innate, or as we've heard from Jeremiah over the past few weeks, written on our hearts, that we would have the power within us that will save our souls. And now comes one of the most familiar parts of the passage, a concept that to some puts James at odds with Paul. Recall that Paul speaks of our salvation through faith alone. And here James writes that if we have determined, if we have determined to live according to the word, believe the word, understood the word, if we are to live the Christian life, we must be doers of the word, not just listeners. And here James employs an image. It's a fun image. He says that if one just listens to the word and comes in on a Sunday, comes in on a Sunday and sits near the front, thank you very much, and sings out and recites the creeds without looking, if you do this and you walk through the doors to brunch and to gossip, and then you're like the person who looks in a mirror for a moment and then heads out the door into their day forgetting what they saw. My wife Rebecca and I had a friend when we lived in New York his name was Bob Beauchamp, and he was the fashion director at Gentleman's Quarterly. And Bob said this, he said, before you leave the apartment, before you leave the house, check the mirror. Before you leave the apartment, before you leave the house, check the mirror. He said that some people miss the message and they miss the mandate, and they lose a the chance to be a doer, one of the bearers of the sacred. And what's more, if you forget to look in the mirror before you leave, it's one of the biggest sources of, of visual pollution. Now, I had no idea that Bob was so biblically literate or for that much interested, but what he said speaks to this passage. James is saying that the person, once again, who glances in the mirror and walks away forgetting, misses the chance to be a productive part of God's God's kingdom. But for those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, law of grace, remembers the law and perseveres, not just listening, but doing, as you've heard, they will be blessed. Now the word that James uses for the one looking into the perfect law of freedom, this word is the same word that's used when Peter runs and he looks into the empty tomb. Remember, he runs there quickly and he peers around the corner and he looks, he looks uh, narrowly and searchingly to discern, to see clearly. So we ourselves, we look into the perfect law of freedom. Now, is this a contradiction of terms? Laws, remember, rules made to confine or restrict. But remember, we saw as, as we've looked at this over the past few weeks, we've heard Christ reference the law of the Torah and that these laws were a, a way of living, a way of living that might claim, so we might claim the inheritance that is ours and live in abundance in the land promised. Now let's look, let's look at the definition of freedom. It isn't that we might live totally unrestricted and unrestrained without guidelines or boundaries. Say you buy a computer and in the instruction booklet it says, get a surge protector. Or if you buy a new car and the manual says, service every 15,000 miles and you say, nah, <laughs> no, nah, I don't need to. It's a new car. Well, the car was created to function a certain way. The computer was created to function a certain way with certain parameters. To not care for it in the way that's prescribed destroys it. You know, freedom is a word on everybody's lips. It seems that everyone places a high priority on personal freedom. However, the focus of individual desire for freedom often finds expression in various ways. Freedom is in various ways such as, you know, I'm a businessman, I'm a capitalist, so I want to be free of government restrictions. Or I'm a teenager and I want to be free to make my own rules and, and do what I want to. 
the freedoms that people are seeking involve freedom from something. Freedom from something. From fear, from traditions, from, from poverty, from social institutions or imposed values and so on. But as pastor and theologian Tim Keller wrote in his book, The Reason for God, Belief in an Age of Skepticism, freedom then is something, is not just the absence of limitations and constraints, but being limited and bound by the right constraints. He uses this illustration to make this point about freedom. He talks about a fish, a fish that is caught and then it's, it's reeled in and then all of a sudden it's taken off the hook and it's put on the ground and it can't move properly and it can't breathe. You see, a fish absorbs oxygen from water rather than air. The fish dies if we don't honor the reality of its nature. And then he goes on to argue that freedom isn't simply the absence of confinement and constraint. In fact, confinement and constraint can actually be a means to liberation. Men and women, we've been created in the image of God, our creator. And we have a manual, yes we do, a source of authority, the word of God. So we bridle our tongues. We care for those on the margins, those who are vulnerable. The word assures us that we are loved, therefore we must love. The word assures us that we are forgiven, therefore we must forgive. You see, God doesn't want our puffery. God doesn't want our liturgies or our songs if we don't offer our hearts, our resources, our lives in action. We're living in treacherous times, treacherous times, but filled with promise if we read, if we listen, if we enact, and if we fulfill the word of God. Hashtag decency. Hashtag unity. Hashtag respect. Hashtag truth. Word up. Amen.